Russell East, serving as station manager for ANA 20, Christian Radio, 103.9 and 95.3 of the Truth Network. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today, this afternoon. And uh, so I just want to encourage you, after the debate's over, to join us across the street from Weber State at 3701 Harrison Boulevard, where, where we will continue the discussion. Uh, we have a little bit of pizza coming over, and so uh, a little bit of, refre of refreshments, and just some more time, additional time, to talk about the things in this afternoon's debate. So you're all welcome to join us there. Uh, yeah. I want to give my phone number out, just because at the end of the debate, there'll be some time for you to ask a question. So I'm gonna give you my number, so you can text me the question, and then I'll just read them as I get them. So I'll give this number again, but the number is 801-645-7433. And so you can say if it's for Matt or for David, uh, just de designate that in your question. That number again is 801-645-7433. So if I could direct your attention to your program, does anybody need a program? Does everybody have one? I'll direct your attention there. By way of introduction, I'll, I'll start that in just a moment. Um, I'll start out with a little bit of introductions. Um, then I'll pray and then we'll turn things over to start things up with Matt. Okay, so our, our first participant in this afternoon's debate is Matt Slick. He's the radio host of Matt Slick Live. It's a nationally syndicated radio program. He's the founder and president of CARM, Christian Apologetics and Research Ministries and Counterpoint Ministry. David Robinson has served two full-time missions for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He served 27 years as a tour guide um, at the, the Church History Museum. Uh, just wanted to mention that, that David is not speaking formally as a representative of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but he will be presenting the viewpoints of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, as, as to the rules, you can see on the program, I'll be trying to do my best to keep track of times and, and so forth, so it should be a very good time to, to uh, get some good perspectives here on, 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 on what the Bible teaches. As you can see, our title for the debate is, Does the Bible Teach Salvation is by Faith Alone or by Works? So with that, let me pray, and then we'll, we'll begin this afternoon's debate. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us this time. Thank you for the friends and family that have gathered here today. Lord, this time is committed to you for your glory. So please intervene and, and speak to us through your word. Speak to us this afternoon. Make things clear. And help us to keep talking and asking questions and getting to the bottom of this very important question. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And with that, let's welcome both of our participants, Matt Slick and David Robinson. <laughs> and Matt, we'll go ahead and have you begin with a five-minute introduction of Hello, how are y'all doing out there? Good. Yeah. Good. Great. Let's try again. How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I got two questions. Uh, how many of you listen to me on the radio? <laughs> oh yeah. Do I sound or I look like what I sound like? <laughs> yes. Uh, you do. One guy said I'm supposed to be about this tall, fat, big glasses, and bald head. <laughs> so uh, my last name really is Slick. I was born with it, learned to run as a kid. I moved 40 times in my life, and I did apologetics. I started back in 1980. Just want to let you know. And I want to quote to you. I paraphrase a little bit, but I'm going to quote to you what got me started in apologetics, what got me started uh, 44 years ago. I was at a Bible study, and I had met this friend, I'm still friends with him, his name is Charlie Spine, so Slick and Spine used to hang out with him. <laughs> and he wrote this book, and all these affidavits and all these indictments, it is all the devil, all corruption, false swears, all hell boiled over, you burning mountains roll down, your lava for I will come out on the top at last. I have more to both than, than ever any man had. I've done more to keep the church together since the days of Adam. Neither John, Paul, Peter, nor Jesus ever did such a work as I. The followers of Christ ran away from him, but my followers, Latter-day Saints, never ran away from me. Yeah, that was Joseph Smith, History of the Church, volume uh, 6, page 408, 409. I got so mad at that quote, I snatched the paper out of this guy's hand. And I said, who said this? And he said, Joseph Smith. I said, who's that? And he said, the founder of Mormonism. And I said, well, Mormons are Christians, but this guy's not. 
He said, no, they're not Christians. And I said, yes, they are. He said, no, they're not. And I said, why aren't they? And he told me what they believe. And I went, what? That started me studying. So now the CARM website, how many have been to the CARM website? Okay. Yesterday, it hit 163 million visitors. Wow. 163 Praise million Jesus. yesterday. So yeah. Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm autistic. I have Asperger's. And so the reason I bring it up is because it makes me write very succinctly to the point. If you want to know what the Trinity is, you go there, you get it, and that, that much. You have to read 18 pages, and finally the Trinity is, you know. <laughs> so you can go and you can read, you can check it out, okay? So go, go to carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G. I've written nine books, some science fiction stuff, and I've also written a humor book, which I, if you guys are single, how many single guys you got in here? Single guys? Okay, get my book, How to Woo and Win Women by Being an Obnoxious Jerk. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. No research necessary. I'm natural. It's all there. Just go looking. Check it out. And I've been on radio uh, about 21 years now. Um, so I'm doing that. Love debates. And I'm constantly, constantly on the internet. Discord, Pal Talk, um, Clubhouse, Facebook, dealing with, no offense, men, but the, the cults. I deal with Roman Catholicism and its apostasy. I deal with, with Eastern Orthodoxy and its apostasy. And I talk about what the soteriological, monergistic truth is of the scriptures based on the Trinitarian essence. I talk about that in other isms and istics. I love big words. <laughs> Particularly when you want to date with your wife and you say something, hey, you know, you say, Siska Padillion, she goes, Shh. So I like big words. I'll be using a few, but if I do, I will tell you what they mean. All right, sound good? You guys ready? Yes. Yes. Ready. Some of you have asked yourselves, just who would be dumb enough to debate Matt Slick? <laughs> yeah. Well, here I am, and I've been asking myself that same question. So I'd like to thank the Rochio Christie Club for putting this debate together. Uh, Weber State University for hosting, Russies for moderating, Matt Slick for traveling so far for this, and all of you for being here tonight. Now, as far as this debate is concerned, I have to admit, I feel like a little kid who's been out playing sandlot baseball who suddenly got called straight to the big leagues. And don't get me wrong, it's not like I don't debate religion much. I've just never had a debate with actual rules. You see, some of my debates were judged on who could yell the loudest, and at times, I've done really good. Uh, but don't worry, my wife made me promise I'd be on my best behavior tonight. <laughs> Even still, I might get a little excited, my eyeballs will get big. I will not be as eloquent in my speeches, Mr. Slick. In fact, at times tonight, some of you might even think that I'm quite the, uh, well, to keep it biblical, you might think that I'm just like Balaam's cocky ass, and I'm okay with that. So I have a lot of friends who are evangelical Christians, um, including ministers, so what I have to say tonight is not an attack on any of you um, or your love and faith in Jesus Christ, but it is an attack on the man-made philosophy of sola fidei faith alone, and some of the false teachings that evolved from that faith alone philosophy. So are we saved by faith alone or works? Is this as if it has to be one or the other? And what are we saved from? Well, there's two deaths, the physical and spiritual, and they're both covered by grace. But through the atonement of Christ, the physical death has been taken care of, and that everyone will now be resurrected. Um, the spiritual death, which determines our eternal reward, it requires some effort on our part. So the physical death was taken care of over 2,000 years ago. Jesus took upon him the sins of the world. While on the cross, he said, it is finished. He broke the chains of death and hell, allowing everyone to be resurrected. This is his free gift of grace. Jesus is 100% responsible for this. There's nothing you or I can say or do to accept it or reject it or to merit it. We cannot attend the temple. 
You cannot accept Jesus as your personal Savior. It's his free gift. Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. In 1 Timothy 2, the Apostle Paul says that God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. In chapter 4, he says that God is the Savior of, the, of all men, especially those that believe. So just like the title of my favorite Clint Eastwood movie, everyone will be resurrected. The good, the bad, and the ugly, which gives me hope. Now some have confused this gift of grace, and they made up a mathematical theorem. A plus B equals C. Faith plus alone equals salvation. It's called the faith, and open, faith alone philosophy. And while it's a popular tradition, it is anything but biblical. Now Matt would have you to believe that by faith alone, salvation, immediate. Nothing else you can do. Oh, and us Mormons, well, we're going to work our way to heaven, as if I have that kind of power. Faith and belief are essential. But it's not an end-all. We still need to repent and be baptized, obey the commandments, and repent some more. Our spiritual salvation is a process that we need to continue in and endure, not when it's convenient, but to the end, through trials and tribulations, knowing that it's after we do the will of God that we receive our reward. Now, because we're judged and rewarded by our works, we teach to be good and do good. And while I seek to be justified, I want a good and honest heart. Because there are so many scriptures that say that we can believe and still fall away, we need more than just faith alone. We need to add to that faith so we don't fall away. Oh, I've got time. Thank you. Um, okay, well, there's a... Thank you. There's a good chance that I may offend someone tonight, or some too. Um, so whether you like my charming personality or lack thereof, it doesn't matter. Tonight's debate is not about who is right, it's about what is right. So please judge the truth on the message given, not on the messenger given. Thank you. At this time, we'll have Matt give a 15-minute presentation statement. Followed by a four minute rebuttal by David. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I hope this is edifying and I hope it glorifies God. I have 43 7. Can't hear you. Can't hear me? No. Okay. Matt, this is the microphone. It's not. Use this one? Test it. Yeah. This is what we're using then, Charlie? Are you working in? What's that? Test one, two. There we go. Sound good? Better keep good. talking. Better? All right. If you, we'll if you speak into that mic there, yeah. then you can I'll, be I'll do that well. There. Okay. Put this here. All right. So I do want to thank everybody for um, for coming. And I know it's a, an inconvenient time on a Friday, but that's just how it, it worked out. What I'm going to do is read my opening statement. It'll be more in front to you later on. So our topic is... Uh, does the Bible teach salvation is by faith or works? So this is an incredibly important topic because it deals with the nature and extent of the atoning work and capability of God in flesh, Jesus Christ. Now the Bible is the topic, not the Book of Mormon, or the Quran, or feelings, or anything else. Not the trustworthiness of anything like that. It's just what does the Bible say. I assert that the Bible teaches that salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, and that adding works to salvation is a false gospel. And, that result, and it results in damnation. I assert that adding works to achieve salvation is in and of itself damnable. Now, in order for us to get through this, we've got to find our terms. I always tell people on the radio, what do you mean by this? And define terms, define terms. The Bible is that set of books, 66, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Salvation is being delivered from the righteous judgment of God. And this includes forgiveness of all of our sins, justification and ultimately dwelling eternally with God in peace. This is for his glory. It is not, as some say, merely physical resurrection. Faith 
is in the context of our debate, faith is the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual trust that per a person has in the work of Jesus on the cross. Now, by the way, just so you know, God grants that we have faith, Philippians 1.29, and that faith is in Christ, John 6.29. He gives it to whom he desires. Works, again, uh, in our, the context of our debate, is uh, the actions that are done by individuals, usually according to the Old Testament law, loving God, loving your neighbor, not lying, not stealing, not committing adultery, being good, doing things like that. All right, we get into a lot about that, and if you hear me on the radio, you know I can talk about this issue quite a bit, but don't have time here. So what does the Bible say? Do we obtain salvation by faith or works? Now notice, the topic is not a combination of faith and works. It is faith or works. I'm very technical. And so it's either this or that. However, if you're going to have works, you also have faith. Okay, so I'm going to grant that. I'm not going to get into the minutia. But I'll grant that in relation to this uh, topic, to this salvation, that those who do good works also have faith in God. All right. But is it our faith combined with our works that gets us saved? Or is it our faith alone in God that gets us saved? All right. Well, let's find out. What does the Bible say? In Acts 16, uh, 30 through 31, the Philippian jailer asked, What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Titus 3, 5. This is a critical verse. A lot of people should memorize Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. This is something Catholicism and Eastern Orthodox teach and other groups. Uh, but he did this according to his mercy. Second Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. And 1 Peter 1.9, obtaining as an outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Clearly, the Bible teaches salvation is by faith without works. That's what it says what it says. All right, now, justification is a part of salvation. Justification is a legal standing before God. Now, in Romans 5, 9, Paul relates, he connects justification and salvation. He says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. So justification and salvation are connected. Justification is a legal standing in court of the law. Salvation is being delivered from the righteous judgment of God. They both have to occur. They're concomitant. That means that they are related and simultaneous. All right? Romans 4, 1 through 5. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to his righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. There it is. There it is. Amen. Romans 3.28, amen. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The works of the law are summarized by Jesus in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, when he says, love God, love your neighbor, it's a summation of all things, quoting uh, Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 18, uh, 7, 19, 18, 18, 19, in the Old Testament, respectively. Galatians 2.16 says, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, note what Paul does. He contrasts faith and works. He says, it's not this, it's this. Done. Done. If you want to add works, if you don't have the true gospel, and I'll show you why a little bit later. So, clearly, that's what the Bible says. Now, at this point, I want to introduce a concept. Now, I'm a theologian. I love theology. I love teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity. And I could teach on the Trinity for a long time. I'd get into some really interesting stuff about it. Don't have time here. But I want to show you something. Hopefully, this will make sense. It makes sense to me. Now, if it doesn't make sense to you, tell me later, and I'll work on it. The Trinitarian God is an entirely unique concept in all of theological examinations. I've been doing this for 44 years, and I've studied hundreds and hundreds of groups. I've never seen anybody approach the Trinity. They've had three gods, that's not the Trinity. Or one God and three manifestations, that's not the Trinity either. The Trinity is one being who's eternal, 
doesn't have a beginning, does not have an end, and he eternally exists as the one only God in all existence, place and time, in a Trinitarian essence, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct, simultaneous, co-eternal persons. I could talk about his theity, divine simplicity, inseparable operations, economic trinity, and ontological trinity, but I don't have time for all that, and I love doing that. So if you go across the street later and you go, please teach me about this trinity, I'm gonna go, yes. Oh, that's right. All right, now, why is that important? Because in the doctrine of the Trinity, we have the second person, the Word, who became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is God in flesh. He calls us the hypostatic union. He has two natures in one person, divine and human. And he's still a man right now, just so you know. Okay? And ask me later why he was baptized, and I'll tell you why. It has to do with him being a man, the high priest, and everything else. Now, why is this important? Because... Jesus, who's God in flesh, made under the law, Galatians 4.4, 4, for a little while more than the angels, Hebrews 2.9, he's the one who fulfilled the law perfectly and never sinned, 1 Peter 2.22. So he did everything perfectly. I've done nothing perfectly in my entire life. I don't believe I've done a single thing that's been pure. That's my honest opinion of myself. I don't believe a single thing I've ever done is pure because I'm a sinner at the core of my being. Try not to be, but that's just the way it is. Now, when you have God, he's the one who becomes one of us, and he's the one who lives the law perfectly, then he's done everything. He's done it right in his intention. He's done it right by his hands. He's done it right by his word. And he's God, so he therefore has a sacrifice of infinite value to be able to uh, propitiate the sacrifice that turns away wrath, to propitiate the wrath of God. 1 John 2, 2, 4, 10. He can do that. And he's on, he's, as a man, he can offer a sacrifice on behalf of people. That means he's done it all perfectly. It's finished on the cross to tell us die. It is finished, John 19, 30. It is done, it's finished. What do we do? Are we going to go to the cross? Are we going to crawl up to that cross where the blood of God himself is coming down, draining down the wood, draining from his feet, draining onto the mud? Are we going to walk up there? Are we going to crawl up there? And are we going to take a list of our good deeds, our baptism, our communion, our going to church, our tithing, or whatever it is you do, and you're going to nail it to the cross next to that blood, and hopefully God the Father will accept not only the blood of Christ, but your works as well. And the combination will get you salvation because that's what the other gospel is. And Paul says in Galatians 1, 8, 9, he repeats that if we or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Mm -hmm. Amen. The gospel is a death, burial, resurrection. Only in the Trinity do we have the one who was offended also be the one who became one of us so that he could satisfy the law so we could go to the one who's offended and ask him to forgive us of our sins. Jesus is prayed to in the Bible, and go through. I show you all kinds of stuff about that, where He has all authority in heaven and earth. Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen, and you can ask Jesus anything. Um, <clears throat> John fourteen, fourteen, and He will forgive you of all of your sins. You don't need a priest. You don't need baptism. You don't need good works. You don't need anything because all of it is by the works of your own hand, touched by your sin. If you were to add into that to what Christ has done, then you're saying what you have done is not sufficient. That's what you're saying. The Bible clearly teaches, if it's by grace, it is no longer the basis of works. Romans 11, 6. And Galatians 5, 2 through 4. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, circumcision was a representation of the law. I could teach on baptism and circumcision quite a bit. So Christ says, he says, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision, he's under obligation to keep the whole law. And I can go on to James 2.10 and Galatians 3.10, which talks about the issue of if you're going to be justified before God and saved before God by anything you do under the law, then you are obligated to fulfill all that law. But I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Those of us who have died with Christ, Romans 6.6, 6, Romans 6.8, Colossians 3, 1 through 5. If you have died with Christ and you have died to the law, Romans 7, 4, and when you read Romans 5, 13, the law has no jurisdiction over you if you have died. We therefore are not under obligation to follow that law. We can do whatever we want as Christians. But you know what? I'm indwelt by the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to honor my wife. I'm going to honor him. I'm not going to lie about him. I'm not going to misrepresent him. I'm not going to lie to any of you. I'm going to honor people because I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why I do what I do, for his glory, not for mine, mm -hmm. not for 
exaltation. Now, the Bible teaches salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. I've already gone through the verses. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Titus 3, 5. You're saved by grace through faith, not by works. It specifically says it. Specifically. It says justification, which is a legal declaration of righteousness. So the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. This is the true gospel. This is what the Trinity has given to us. But triads or modal anarchianism or sabellianism or unitarian universalism and all the false theologies and, and Islam and everything that is out there, their gods are insufficient and so their gospels are also insufficient because they don't have the God dying for them. They have a God or a prophet or somebody else dying for them and they switch the responsibility of the one forgiving, the one who's offended God to a created thing and they transfer it over and it does not work. I can expand on that a lot. <laughs> this one gets me going. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. I'm going to end with this. I've got about a minute, two minutes. i got a lot more I can say. When I was 17, when I was 17, I was involved in the occult, pornography, foul language, everything except drugs. I don't know why I did drugs, never have. I went to a church one day just to see about Jesus, that guy, whatever, no problem. And I ended up walking forward to receive Jesus, yawn, yawn, I'm bored, might as well give him a try. That's my attitude. And then, the Holy Spirit himself came upon me with such power that all I could do was throw my face to the ground and moan and wail in the agony of being in the presence of incredible holiness. And this went on and on like waves, tidal waves upon my heart. Light beating into my soul, exposing my sin, causing me to force my face to the ground or the carpet and moan and almost yell out the agony of being in the presence of incredible holiness. And then to the left of me, Jesus was there. Couldn't see him, couldn't touch him. His holiness, his purity. I still remember to this day, that was 50 years ago. I still remember him. Remember his presence and his holiness. This is true. I've calmed down a lot since then. 50 years, and one thing I know, you want a testimony? I'll give you a testimony of Jesus Christ. You don't add to what he's done. Amen. Because in his presence, everything you have is touched by sin, and the only thing you can do is bow down, and you rely on him. That's what it means to be justified by faith. Faith in him, because faith is only as good as who you put it in. Faith is only as good as who you put it in, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ whom you have you must serve. You must serve him. You must glorify the Lord Jesus. Trust in what he has done. Not in yourselves, not in any works, not in any capability, not sincerity, not your baptism. These things are important, but they do not add to the blood of God on the cross. And that's why he grants you faith, that you be justified by faith, and not by your efforts, but by what he's done. Amen. 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 We'll have David present a four minute rebuttal. I'll clap for that too. That was excellent. And I've got the wrong group here because you guys are saying amen and my people don't say that. So come on. Liven it up a little bit. Uh, no, that was really enjoyable. And, and I loved his conversion story. And I hear that in all different religions. I, and, and it's wonderful. And I think God works in all different religions. Um, the one thing I wanted to say amen with Matt was when he says, if you add words, it's damnable. It's damnable. You know, of all the people that always quote to me and say, hey, don't add or subtract, Revelations 22, that's going to be pretty well the theme of my talk today. Um, Justification, I mean, do I go there? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna go there. Okay, um, Matt knows all these big words. I think if we were in the military, he'd be a Navy SEAL. I'm not even a weekend warrior. Um, I dropped out of this very institution my senior year in college and started a lawn mowing business. So I don't know these big words, 
if you came here looking to see two intellects going toe to toe, you're gonna go home disappointed. Um, I'm sufficiently ignorant enough that I've never been accused of being an intellect. I like them, they make for great conversations, but I'm more of a guy that goes with William Tyndale, who said, how did he say that? He said that if he could finish translating the Bible, that a boy that plowed the field would know more than the Pope. Um, I used to mow lawns for a living, so I'd humor myself and say I was a lawn mowing boy. Um, I don't know all these big things, but I can read the Bible. And on justification, it never says you're justified by faith alone. It never does. You can add it all you want, but I just, I've got a few things in James that says that by works a, a man is justified and not by faith only. He can work on that one. Matthew 12 says that by words you're justified. I didn't bring my water up here. And it says if we believe we're justified, and then it says we're justified without deeds of the law. And that would be the law of Moses, and we agree with that too. And now we says we're justified by, by his blood. We agree with all of that. I, I love it. Love the Bible. Agree with all of it. Just not the... Um... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, I'm almost out of time. This is amateur hour, folks. Um, anyways, I've got my presentation a little more set forth than he does. Um, but the key thing is, is that... Um, being saved by faith alone is adding to the Bible. And we're going to see how that's being added to the Bible. Um, faith is a beautiful thing. I'm so glad we're not, we're not living the law of Moses. If I lived the law of Moses, I'd have been stoned a couple times already. Um, it's a terrible thing. It's a hard law to live. Um, faith is where it is at. But it's not faith alone. Never was faith alone. Never taught in the Bible. You, you can come up with all these scriptures and say, see this and see that and see that, but why don't we just stick with what's in the Bible? If you're a biblical church, you need to look and read exactly what the Bible says. Um, 30 seconds, I'm pretty well lost. Maybe by the next rebuttal I'll do a little better. Um, but yeah, I'm ready to start my thing, and so we'll move forward. Thank you. I say these things in Jesus' name, amen. amen. At this time, David will present a 15-minute statement. So I meet people all the time that say they belong to a biblical church and that all of your teachings come from the Bible. And I'll ask them, would you belong to a church where some man cherry picks the scriptures and then tells you what he thinks God is trying to say, not what God actually says? And their answer is always absolutely not. It has to be written in the Bible. You can tell what group of people I'm talking to, can't you? But when we compare their beliefs to what is actually written in the Bible, not only is it different, but quite often, it's exactly the opposite. And we'll look at this later. So I'm going to share some numbers with you. And I'm going with the King James Version. The other Bibles have higher or lower numbers. But the results are the same. And since we can all agree that God is the author of the Bible, it's safe to say that God chose to use the word faith 247 times in the Bible. He used the word alone 108 times. That's 355 times. So how many times do you think that God said we're saved by faith alone? And before you answer that, who do you think said it more? A little trivia. Jesus or the apostles? Most people think the apostles. But they said it the same number of times. And this is a little off topic, but um, the sinner's prayer. Um, a sinner's prayer, for you that don't know, it's a prayer that um, evangelical Christians can give. It doesn't save them, it's just a way to talk to God and commune with God, and, and as part of the process, they'll accept Jesus as their personal Savior and a hell-bound sinner. Um, but there were 650 prayers given in the Bible. How many of those do you think were the sinner's prayer? And again, who said it more, Jesus or the apostles? Well, 
They said it the same number of times too. But here's where it really gets interesting, and I'm not evangelical. Jesus and the apostles said that we're saved by faith alone the exact number of times that Jesus and the apostles said the sinner's prayer. I mean, unbelievable. What are the odds of that? Could this just be a coincidence? I don't think so. Because when something this unlikely happens, we should seriously take note. And more important, just what is the message that God was trying to give us? Oh, and the number of times they said it? That would be zero. Never. Not just never, but never ever. God never said that. And so my question to Matt will be, since Jesus never said the words faith alone or the apostles, I'm curious. What's the name of the man who made up that philosophy? And since it isn't written in the Bible, it would be nice to know what book it was first written in. You know, um, just the year maybe, if, if it was written in the Dark Ages or the Renaissance, I don't know. So before we go on, I want you to know I'm not an illusionist up here manipulating the scriptures so you can't read that it says we're saved by faith alone. And as much as I'd love to tell my grandkids that um, Grandpa's a Jedi Master, you will not see the words faith alone in the Bible. My side should have laughed. It's just not written in the Bible. And to think that Martin Luther, probably the greatest proponent of the faith alone philosophy, said that this is the basis of your entire religion. And it's not even written in the Bible. Unbelievable. Seriously, Matt, if we were up at the football stadium, somebody would be spiking a football. And it wouldn't be him. This alone should be enough to show that faith alone is nothing more than a man-made philosophy. Especially if you believe in sola scriptura, the Bible alone. That all your teachings come directly from the Bible. But your teaching is if you have a prophet. And I'm a huge fan of modern day apostles and prophets. But if you're not, you should be extremely concerned. But I don't want to call the game just yet, because when you add, when you take the... Um, Teachings from this faith alone philosophy, um, it absolutely goes from bad to worse. Um, <coughs> now, because A plus B equals C, you know, faith plus alone equals salvation, at this point it doesn't matter. Um, you, you can say whatever you want. Jesus could command us, he could command all men everywhere to repent, which he did, but this philosophy says you don't have to. It won't affect your salvation because you're saved by faith alone. And now let's look at two of these. First off, if you want, you'll want to obey the commandments, but you don't have to. You're still saved. Well, did you know? Let's look at a couple commandments. Forty-four times God used the word fornication in the Bible. Singular or plural, fornication, fornicators. <clears throat> excuse me. And of those 44, how many times did God say you could commit fornication and you're still saved? Well, the answer is zero. Exactly the opposite. In fact, in 1 Timothy, he says, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. <clears throat> Acts 1 says it's worthy of death. You should flee fornication. Deliver such an one into Satan. And Galatians 5 says the works of the face, flesh are manifest. Which are these? Fornication is one, and it says that you will not enter into the kingdom of God. In the same theme, let's go on to adultery. 54 times it was used. Now, of those 54 times, how many times did God say you could commit adultery and you're still saved anyway? Because you're saved by great faith. <clears throat> um, well, the answer is zero, exactly the opposite. God himself wrote on some tablets, 10 commandments. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus reiterated it in Mark 10:19 says, do not commit adultery. James says that adulterers and adulteresses are the enemy of God. Jesus said he cast him into the bed with him to commit adultery in great tribulation, unless you repent. And again, in Galatians, he says you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, well, we can't expect every commandment to have that. But obey was used 158 times. And I even used disobey. Because God might have come and said... You may want to, you, you might disobey, but you're saved anyways. Well, out of the 158 times, how many times do you think he said that? The answer would be zero, exactly the opposite. In Romans 15, I gotta work on this. 
He says that the Gentiles are to be obedient in all things. Peter says we're to be obedient children, um, we're to obey him, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of obedience. And Paul writes to know the proof that whether you're obedient in all things. Okay, have you ever wondered why the winds and the waves obey Jesus, the devils obey Jesus, but magically, if you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you don't have to obey Jesus anymore. It makes no sense. And finally, almost 900 times, the word commandment was used. Okay, 899, but who's counting? And of those 899, how many times did he say we could break the commandments and we're still saved anyways? Well, here again. Before I tell you this, a little hint, we've got a pattern. So far, everything the faith alone philosophy has taught has not been written in the Bible. So you may want to stick with the pattern. Okay, how many times did it say? That's right, zero. Exactly the opposite. John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. John, 1 John 2, I know him that keepeth not the commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 2 Thessalonians, he wants you to both do and will do the things we command you. And Matthew 28, Jesus taught him to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This faith alone philosophy was never taught in the Bible. Let's look at another false teaching, and we'll get to that. Um, we're going to see about, a little bit about faith. I've always considered it a work. Um, Webster said a work is anything brought about due to an effort, and um, this is an effort, and we'll see what Paul has to say. Actually, twice in Thessalonians, he says, well, remember without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love. Um, Hebrews 6, we have faith and patience inherits the promise, not faith alone. Re Revelations 14, we're to commit, commit, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In my introduction, I said that we needed to add to our faith. I was, I was talking about Peter in 2 Peter 1. It says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and knowledge temperance and so on. And then it says, if you do this, you will not fall. Notice that faith is never alone. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 to fight the good fight of faith. Um, in 1 Timothy, he says that some shall depart the faith. In 1 Timothy 5, he says some having damnation because they cast off their faith. This faith, once you have it, you'll never lose it, is not in the Bible. In Hebrews 11, 12, 20, excuse me. Um, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For God spared not the natural branches. Take heed, lest he spare not thee. Behold the goodness and severity of God on them that fell severity, but towards thee goodness. If if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you this gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, which also you are saved, if, if you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. Paul couldn't have said it any clearer. This refutes the once saved, always saved. So let's get this straight. You have to have faith alone to be saved. But many people had faith and belief, and everyone thought they were saved, but after weeks or months or years, they departed or they cast off. And it turns out that being saved is not enough. No. Why, these people were never truly saved because they didn't truly believe. They did not have saving faith. So why don't you teach how to be truly saved and have saving faith to begin with? Instead, you teach that all you need is faith alone. What you've done is called bait and switch. So make up your mind. Because faith alone and saving faith are two different things. One is alone. One requires action on your part. Just read the parable of the sower. If you had an honest and a good heart and believed and produced fruit, you were saved. But if you believed and you received it with joy, but you believed but for a while, you endured but for a while, 
And in times of temptation, you fell away because of tribulations and persecutions that arise from the word. He's offended. Also, by the cares of this world, you don't fall away because you didn't truly believe. You fell away because of these reasons. Jesus never taught faith alone. And just so you know, the Bible never says, truly believed, truly saved, or saving faith. Never says it. They are just more made-up words which fit right in your other made-up word, faith alone. And as Matt says, is the most damnable thing to add the words to the Bible. Your faith alone philosophy does not exist unless you add the word alone. Thank you. This time, Matt will give a four minute rebuttal. You know, they call me slick. I'm gonna have to be quick. See if I can get through some of this stuff. It's easier to break a vase than it is to put it back together. <clears throat> Four minutes. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Whether or not God uses the word faith or works, this, this, or <clears throat> not, more or not, it doesn't make any difference. The issue is what does the scripture say? And I mentioned the sinner's prayer. There is a sinner's prayer in the Bible. A lot of people don't know this. Go to Luke 18, 9 through 14. The tax gatherer and the Pharisee went up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee said, look, I do these good things, I don't do these bad things. And the tax gatherer said, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus says, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. No works at all were taught by Jesus in this point, but by belief only. Jesus did teach it, he taught it with justification. So Jesus, now one of the apostles used the word faith alone. Actually, that's not accurate. James, uh, he does use the word faith alone. James 2, 14 through 26. And the man is justified not by faith alone. Now, the context about that I've written on a great deal. And it's, on a, it's called justification on the horizontal. You go to verse 18. You show me your faith, I'll show you my faith. And that's what he's talking about. So justification there is between people. I can exegete that verse by verse because we have time in a four-minute rebuttal. But that's what that is. He said that faith alone is a philosophy. Well, everything's a philosophy, uh, one way or another. It's a, it's a love of knowledge and love of wisdom, and we're looking at it. But what we want to say is that it's, is it biblical, all right? Well, um, <clears throat> he said, I find this a lot with people, uh, that faith alone philosophy means you don't have to repent. That's not true. God grants us repentance, 2 Timothy 2.25. He grants that we come to Christ, John 6.65. 6, you cannot come to me unless the Father grants it to you. He grants that you have faith, Philippians 1.29. But God indwells us, John 14.23, makes us new creatures, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So he grants us repentance along with our salvation because that's what is, is part of it. It's God's work. It's false religious systems who say, no, you don't have to repent. That's what you guys are teaching. It's never what we teach. When they say that, they don't understand our position. We teach that we're justified by faith, but along with it, God indwells us. John 14, 23, we're born again. John 3, 3 through 8. We're made new creatures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. As soon as I became born again, I stopped so many things because I'm indwelt by God. I don't have to do those things to keep myself right because Jesus did it all. So I would recommend to people on the radio when I do debates, when I do, I do impromptu discussions, I say that's not our position. Please understand our position before you try and address it. If you don't address it properly, you're essentially bearing false witness. Now that, that means they know something's wrong. Now he doesn't, maybe doesn't know, I'm not accusing. I'm just saying that's not our position. It's not our position that we don't have to repent. It's okay to go out and sin all you want and just do, do all that stuff. That's never been our position. First John 2, 4, if you say you know him and don't keep his commandments, the truth is not in you and you're a liar. Amen. I've quoted that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to people. Mm -hmm. You say you're a Christian, let's see it. That's what James 2, 2 through, uh, 14 through 26 is about. You say you're a Christian, I want to see it. Let's see your faith. Let's see how you are. And does the Bible teach you've been saved by grace through faith without works? Yes, it does. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You have been saved through faith and not of yourselves and the gifts of God. Not as a result of works. Right there, faith and works. We have two things. You have two things, thank you. 
faith and works, and one's removed, the other's by itself. It's just simple logic. If I have an apple, an orange, and a bag, take the apple out, the orange is what's left. It's alone. That's what faith is. That's what faith alone means. You can go to Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. 2 Peter, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 9. He saved us and called us of the holy calling, not according to our works. Here's a question to ask, though. Do you keep yourself right with the infinitely holy God by your goodness? That's the question. At this time, <laughs> Matt will present a 15 minute speech. A 15 minute presentation. You have 15 minutes. I will. Amateur hours on display. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump in. So as I said, I'm autistic. I have advantages to that, especially when you're talking, when I'm talking to my wife, and I say, what? I don't get it, you know, I'm making sense. Those are foreheads. But when it comes to theology, I have a 217 page document just on Roman Catholicism, just on that. I have many, many topics. And what I've done is gone through, because the Catholics teach salvation by faith and works. They do it all the time. And this is not about Catholicism, but it says in paragraph 2068 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that you obtain or you attain salvation by faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. Sometimes when I'm talking to them, I quote the Book of Mormon, you save the grace of faith after all you can do, 2 Nephi 25, 23. I talk to them about this. The reason I bring this up is because what I've done is I've analyzed 170 verses in the scriptures that they have used. 174 that they have used to support their, their view. And I put them in my online program. I have the claim, I have the responses, and I have the analysis of the context of all of them. I can go through all these, and we can talk about each one. We don't have time in a format like this. It's just us. The, the nice thing about a debate is we get to go back and forth, but the not so nice thing is we really can't get too in-depth sometimes, unless we're to define something very narrowly to begin mm -hmm. with. That's just what it is, it's okay. But we can get into it real good. Over there if you want. <laughs> Trust me, I can really get good and anal about this. Obstreperous. All right, now, what I want to do is go through James 2. Because this is something a lot of people will use when they go to James 2. I want to just go through it slowly and show you what it really is teaching. James 2, 2 through, uh, 14 through 26 is very often misused. In, by uh, all kinds of people. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? That faith, what faith? The faith that has no works. That's a dead faith. Amen. True faith comes from God, Philippians 1.29, to you it has been granted to believe. It's an aorist passive indicative in the Greek, which means that God has granted it to you. That's why you believe. And that belief is in Jesus, John 6.29. So if God grants you faith and it's in Christ, then it's real true faith, isn't it? Yeah. And along with it, concomitantly speaking, is salvation and regeneration where the Lord indwells us. All of it is a package. <laughs> so our indwelling, our change of our nature, our no longer wanting to follow the ways of the world, our ability to understand the true gospel and believe in Christ. Because in Luke 16, uh, excuse me, Acts 16, 14, God opened the mind of Lydia to understand the things spoken of by Paul. You see, God has to open it. Because if he does not open it to your mind, you will not understand it. You can't, Jesus says, you cannot come to me unless it's granted to you from the Father. Amen. John 6, 65. You can't. It's not in your own ability, and it's not in your own wisdom. This is Calvinism. Sorry, it's a dirty word, I know, but that's what I believe, and that's what I, I teach, and that's what I'll defend. But that's what the scriptures teach. When I get into that, boy, I really teach about that. So, verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warned and be filled, 
Go on. You know, you don't get what's necessary. Well, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. Being by itself. That's not the faith that God grants you, is it? The faith that's dead, that does it's not in Christ, and following Christ, and concomitant, that means at the same time dependent upon one another, it is not concomitant with regeneration and indwelling of God. Jesus said in John 14, 23, the Father and I will come and make our abode in you. Come live in you. Most of the time, that's fine. Sometimes, ouch. <laughs> I've gotten the holy slap a few times in my life. I don't know about you guys, but I have. My two by four, my four by four in heaven, round. <laughs> but some in ways we will say, verse 18 is critical. You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith by, without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. This is called the horizontal. It's justification between people. It's called horizontal. Romans 4, 1 through 5, which I quoted earlier, is the vertical. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found for? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God and was credited in his righteousness. And the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due? But to the one who does not work, but believes. No works, just believe. The one who does not work, but believe, that's faith alone. And him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That's the vertical. This is horizontal. Verse 18. You have faith. I have works. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. That's horizontal. It's justification before people, not before God. Because if God grants you that faith, he knows it's yours. And since we're justified by faith, Romans 5, 1, having therefore been justified by faith. What is that? Okay. I have a friend in mocks me. He goes, I, I used to say in the radio, what was it saying? What is that? <laughs> Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well, that demons also believe and tremble. That's false faith. That's called essentia. In theology, there's the terms essentia and fiducia. Essentia is, yeah, God exists, whatever. Fiducia is, oh my Lord, I trust you, I believe you, I receive you. That's fiducia. That's what God grants to us. That's true faith. The devil himself believes God exists and is powerful. So what? That's why he says, do you believe God is one? You do well, but demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by words when he offered up Isaac on his son on the altar? Across the street, ask me about that. I'll tell you some neat stuff. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, his faith was perfected, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God that it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That's quoted in Romans 4.3. What was credited as righteousness? His faith and his works? No. Even James says no, his faith was. What he's doing is showing that true faith and true works go together, but you're justified by your faith. That's why he then says, he goes on, he says, Abraham believed God, was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see, a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Before who? Before God? Obviously not, but before men. That's the context of James 2. So many people rip it out of context. And sometimes, you maybe hear the radio, I don't say it in the radio so much, but I'll do it when I'm talking to people impromptu things, and they'll copy a verse. You know, it says right there, you know, not by faith alone. And I'll say, did you hear that? Hear what? That ripping sound, like a verse that ripped out of context. You didn't hear that sound. <laughs> <laughs> You're stupid. So, <clears throat> he said that faith alone is a philosophy. That you don't have to repent. I've already addressed that. Yes, you do. Because God does not save us and indwell us so that we can continue in sin. Read Romans 6, 1, 2, and 3. Shall we who have been saved, shall we continue in sin? May it never be. How should we who have been saved be justified? How do we continue in sin? Since I've become saved, oh my goodness. I can't even utter a half truth, a quarter truth, and live with it. I have to confess it. I must. I have to. It is so bad and so strong, I will not dishonor my Lord. That's not to say I won't say something false, not intentionally. We make mistakes, but I will never purposely deceive. And if I have found, I've got to take care of it. Why? Because Jesus lives in me. Because of Jesus. But the good that I do doesn't get me saved. It doesn't keep me right with God. 
See, I don't do this on Salvation Day. <laughs> I don't do that because my works don't play any part of my salvation. They're the result of God's living in me. I don't have any right to say before God, look at what I have done. Look at me. In fact, Jesus talks about that, Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me on that day, the day of judgment, have we not prophesied in your name, in your name performed many miracles, in your name cast out demons, get away from me, I never knew you. What is he condemning them for? Because on the day of judgment, the day of salvation, what are they appealing to for their salvation? Faith and their works. See what I did? Think about it. If God grants that you have faith, Luke 129, and he does, and that faith is in Jesus, John 6, 28, 29. Jesus, they said, what must we do to work the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It's the work of God. So if God gives you that faith, is he going to grant you the repentance also? Yet he says he grants to the Gentiles, 2 Timothy 2, 25. Yes. Is he going to live in you? Yes, Jesus says so in John 14, 23. If Jesus is in you, you're going to accidentally do all the commandments by loving God and loving your neighbor. I don't care about the Ten Commandments. I care about loving God and loving my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so I accidentally do all the rest of them. And when I get to heaven, I'm not going to say, <laughs> you know, I was on radio for 21 years. I wrote nine books. <laughs> and I uh, wrote 6,000 articles on CARM. I debate, man, I show people the truth. <laughs> Look at my works. No. What I'll be doing is hiding behind the robe of my Lord and my Savior Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hold, holding it around me so I want to face the incredible glory of the Holy One. And I'm just going to say, I'm with Him. <laughs> That's it. I'm not going to say, did I not do this and that and that? I'm not adding to salvation. I'm not adding to the work of Christ. I believe in what he did, not what I can do. I remember one day, this is for real. No, no offense, Ben, coming up, and obviously no offense, Ben. But I was praying. I was home alone, and I was praying for 20 minutes. I could not even think of anything else to pray. I was confessing everything. You know, those things that only you and God know. And sometimes I don't even want to talk to God about it because, and so I'm talking to God about everything. I'm screaming. I got nothing left. 20 minutes, nothing left. And then I said, Lord, thank you for not making me like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. That's how it the Pharisee, Luke 18, thank you for not making me like that tax guy. Yeah. Yeah. And I kept praying, and I went, wait a minute, something's not right here. Yeah. And I went back, and I went, oh my goodness. Even in the depths of my humility, there was yeah. pride and there was arrogance. Amen. There's nothing good Amen. in me except the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I get to heaven, nothing that I have done will ever be considered good. I don't know how it's possible. If he looks towards my direction and says, well done. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I know my heart. I have a sermon I love to preach. Who's the biggest sinner you know? And the goal is you're supposed to point to yourself afterwards because you know yourself. And that's the idea of that. But nevertheless, I need to get going on this. Now, talked about verses that say we lose our salvation. No. And talked about obedience. I could talk about obedience verses. I could talk about these verses, you know. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, Hebrews 10, 26, you know, if you do or endure this, like that. And I, can all, I, I know them, okay? I can talk about them. I do it all the time. But there is a verse that few of them recognize. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us because they never were of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained. You see, there's good faith, there's bad faith. Even in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, there is true repentance and false repentance. God doesn't make any mistake when he grants people salvation, and he doesn't make any mistakes when Ephesians 1.4 says he chose us, that's election, before the foundation of the world in him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we be holy and blameless and loving predestinates with adoptions. That, those two verses are killer significant. Please, someone ask me about them and I'll teach. 
I will teach you federal headship. I will teach you election. I will teach you the truth of the word of God. And you will come away going, oh my goodness, he loves me. He loves me and I'm secure in him. He will never leave me or forsake me. Amen. He's five. This is how good he Amen. is. Titus 3, 5 says, he has saved us not on the basis we have done in our righteousness. It's a significant verse. Titus 3, 5. We are saved. We do good works because we're in that place of salvation. And that's how we stay saved. No, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. That refutes that. It's gone. All the other verses must be understood in context. You'll notice that when people do this, when people quote these kind of things, they'll say that you have to do these commandments. Did he say follow the commandments? Did he say keep the commandments? Yes. Where does it say, and that's what gets you saved? Does it say that? Why are they quoting the verses that say you got to follow me and obey? To say, this is how you get saved. It doesn't say that. You do that to show and to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you say you know him and don't keep his commandments, the truth is not in you, and you're a liar. That's 1 John 4, 1 John 2, 4, thank you. So I advocate the truth that Jesus has done everything. There's only one true God. He became flesh in the Trinity, second person. He fulfilled the law perfectly, never sinned, 1 Peter 2, 22, and that he grants us faith, Philippians 1, 29, the faith is in Christ, John 6, 29, and that is well, how we're justified completely and totally by what God has done, not by what we do, and we do not keep ourselves right with the infinitely holy God by our goodness. At this time, David will give a four minute rebuttal. guys have to um, repent, but according to his philosophy, I'm going to say, once you're saved, do you have to repent anymore? I've heard him say no. I'm okay, whatever you guys want to do. Um, this notion that we do good works to be saved, and you do good works because you're saved. Um, works are things that the Heavenly Father has asked us to do. We don't live the law of Moses. Most of the times when they're talking about works, they're talking about the works of the law. Um, and these things like um, the scripture he brought up, he was never one of us. You know, they laughed. You know, when I was young, I was the biggest Minnesota Vikings fan you ever knew. I lived and died through four Super Bowls. I collected their cars, cards, I had their folders. I was a Minnesota Viking fan, and I don't think I've ever watched a game for the last 20 years. Couldn't care less. Don't tell me I wasn't a Minnesota Viking fan. That's, that's... That's his way of saying, hey, you guys, come on, we're together, they've left, but we're not like them. Um, put that one into context. And there's a lot of things I'm putting in context, but one of the things I'm going to talk about right, real quick is this thing that for somehow we do good works because we want to have blessings. Jesus didn't do enough. Jesus did everything, everything. There's nothing we can do that will merit salvation for us. But this obsession with giving rewards and stuff, um, John, John 3, I'm not going to quote scriptures, I mean, I'm not going to say that. Um, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. That's exactly what we teach. Um, Peter, he asked Jesus, he says, what do I receive for following you? Oh, wow, he must be a Mormon. Paul 1, oh, in Corinthians, he says, as far as his teaching, he says, if I do this willingly, I have a reward. It's okay to have rewards. Is this biblical? I'm going to say yes. Um, Jesus, when he taught the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. Oh, I have it written down here somewhere. I'm going to talk about it. Where is it? Um, of, the nice, <clears throat> of the first 12 verses, nine of these things, Jesus promised us blessings. He says, do this and you're going to get this. He even told you you'd go to heaven if you did something. Ooh, 
he must be a Mormon too. You know, in fact, he said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. I'm going to rejoice. Um, in the book of Revelations, the, when it starts out, they write to the seven churches, and what does he do? The first thing, he, he doesn't say, oh, you guys believe and you're saved. He says, I know your works. I know your deeds. They don't work. And if you don't repent, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And then he says, oh, by the way, if you do change, I'm going to give you a reward. And he lists what he's going to do. And they're good rewards. And to sit here and say, well, Jesus did it all, but, you know, you Mormons, you, you do good works to be saved. But we do good works because we're saved. And I'll tell you, there's been a couple times I look at that and I say, oh, so that's what the Pharisees look like. Um, yeah, you, you can't have this obsession. If I see somebody down here that wants a cup of water, and I, I'd be afraid to give them a cup of water because someone would say, oh, you're doing that to get a reward. But if you'll remember, it was Jesus that said, if you give someone a cup of water, you'll receive a reward. I do good works not because I live the law of Moses. Sometimes I do it because I'm selfish. Sometimes I do it because I don't want to go to hell. But I never do it for the law of Moses. And I do it because Jesus teaches it and does it himself. Thank you. At this time, David will be giving a 15-minute presentation. David. Be right there. You say it again? I'm doing it. I've got a 15 minute. Yeah, David will be giving a 15 minute statement for presentation. So just for clarification, 15, 15, and then we're done? No, uh, no 15, 15, 15 minutes for, from 15. David, and then a four minute rebuttal from Matt. And, we each get and then Matt will give a seven minute conclusion, and then David will give a seven minute conclusion. And then Q&A after that. <laughs> By the time we're done, we're going to be really good. I got 15 minutes. I cannot believe that Matt Slick would show up to a debate to prove that we're saved by faith alone, and then he does not even quote Jesus or the apostles saying it. I mean, Matt, if yours is a biblical church, please, by all means, read what to us where Jesus or his apostles actually say in their own words that we're saved by faith alone. If you're a church built on some man's philosophy, then cherry pick different scriptures and tell us what you think God is trying to say. I mean, you're doing really good at that. But I'll bet everybody here would prefer to hear that from the mouth of Jesus as opposed to you putting those words in his mouth. Because if that's the case, you're not going to like this, but if that's the case and your faith is no longer in Jesus, your faith is in Matt and his faith alone philosophy. You have to have faith in Matt that what he thinks God is trying to say is more important than what God actually does say. And that's not good. Now I've been hold, told it's hard to translate Greek and Hebrew into English. But, you know, that's why they never say faith alone. However, somehow God managed 355 times to use the words faith and alone. One time God tried really hard, and he actually got the two words together, James 2.17, even so faith that has not works is dead being alone. In other versions of the Bible it says, James 2.24, that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. And let's up the ante a little bit. 335 times the word you believe was used. That makes 685 times in the Bible that God somehow managed to get the word faith, belief, and alone, but for some reason he could never say faith alone. Um, Oh, then you've got the book of Romans. I hear this all the time. People almost get giddy. 34 times the word faith was used. 
you know, and, um, but never faith alone. We read that by faith the walls of Jericho fell. By faith alone? No. In the same verse it says that it was encompassed after seven days. By faith the destroying angel passed over the children of Israel. By faith alone? No. I'll bet there were a lot of lambs that wished that it was faith alone. So why do you say by faith alone? The Bible never says it. He said it's damnable to, to add to it. Yes, 34 <coughs> times the faith alone, faith was used in the book of Romans. But instead of being excited, maybe you should be concerned that it never says faith alone. We agree with Paul. All 34, oh, all 34 times he said it, we agree with that. The question is, how do I work my computer? <laughs> <laughs> the question. No faith in technology. <laughs> work on it. Okay, so we wonder why you don't agree with it, and why you decided to add the word alone to this. Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. But he was incapable of conveying the word of God as he received it? Apparently, somebody thinks so. So I'll ask an evangelical Christian, how many ways can you be saved? And the answer is always one. They'll say faith alone or believe for, for grace. And they'll quote some scriptures. Romans 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. We agree. Amen. Hallelujah. Mormons, you say that too. <laughs> Ephesians 2 8, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. We agree. We agree with every one of these scriptures, just not you adding the word alone to it. That's why your theorem is A plus B equals C, because none of these say alone. You have to add it. In fact, uh, Ephesians 2 8. It takes 347 verses before God remembered to put the word alone. Yeah. Now, Romans 10, 9 is not so bad. It only took 13. So why do you add the word alone? And I'm not mad. I just get excited. Then I ask, how many ways does the Bible say you can be saved? And of course, you don't have life, salvation, eternal life. It's always one. But you know what? I found over 50 in the Bible. Okay, I'm only going to read a few, ten, just because, time. 1 Peter 3, even baptism doth now save us. Philippians 2, as you have always obeyed, not my word, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Revelations 2, be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Romans 2, through patience, continuous, well-doing, seeking for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life. I haven't seen faith alone in here yet. Romans 13, it's high time to awake out of your sleep because your salvation is nearer than when you believed. Titus 3, not by works of righteousness that we've done, but by his mercy we are saved. 1 John 2, if which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, and you have the Father and the Son, he promises us eternal life. James said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. He shall receive the crown of life. Matthew 19, if you enter into life, keep the commandments. John 6, whoso eat of my flesh and drink my blood hath eternal life. Hebrew 5, he became the author of eternal life. Oh, he just said something about obeying. You'll have to rewind that. Jesus became the author of eternal salvation unto all of those that obey him. Now this is where it gets tough. Who do we believe? I just quoted, who did I quote? Peter, James, John, and Jesus, and Paul. And Matt quoted, I don't know. But in Matt's defense, he is pretty for sure that Jesus possibly intended to say we were saved by faith alone, but Jesus never did. The apostles never did. The Bible never did. Um, I should have known when I saw all this. It was never, ever written in the Bible. And you know what? It even gets worse. Because do you know that the word saved was used in the Bible 104 times? 
and 36 of them actually say how to be saved. And with the topic today, that how are we saved by faith alone, I would have assumed Matt would have got up here and opened the Bible and read 36 times where we're saved by faith alone. But you know why he didn't? And I think everybody knows by now. Because they never said that. But I'll tell you the place where it actually does say. The very first place it says we're saved in the Bible, Matthew 10, 22. And it says here, let's see, he that endureth to the end. Oh, endureth to the end, that can't be right. That's what I said in my intro. Um, you know, because faith alone, immediate, enduring to the end, that could take a lifetime. Um, so who said this? Maybe it's just some heretic that's just trying to say that we're saved by enduring, just to go against that true gospel of faith alone. So who said it? Oh, that's Jesus. And Jesus says it three times. Matthew 10, 23, 2. You shall be hated of all men for my name's sakes, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. He says it in Matthew 24, 13, and Matt, Mark 13, 13. And he is talking about tribulation, but there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that says, through tribulation, you're saved. So let's go over a few more of these. Mark 16. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I just have to throw in that baptized. Um, Luke 7. Thy faith has saved thee. John 10. I am the door. If any man shall open, he shall be saved. Romans. We're saved by hope. We're saved by his life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord is saved. Not alone. In fact, call on the name of the Lord. It goes over many times. Jesus says, why call me Lord and not do what I says? And twice in the Bible, literally, they say, Lord, Lord, the ten virgins in the wedding feast. And, and the Lord sends them away. He says, I don't know you. Um, Ephesians 2, by grace you are saved. 2 Timothy 1, we're saved not according to our works, but his purpose and grace. First, uh, Timothy 2, who will have all men to be saved. John 3, God sent not his son into the world that began to, to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, I realize we're not keeping score, but if we were, it would be ways to be saved that are actually written in the Bible, 20, saved by faith alone written in the Bible, zero. I'm not mad. I'm sorry, guys. If we had time, I could more than double that number. So I guess my question to Matt would be, at what point did you decide that it was okay to take away the words of Jesus out of the Bible? And to take all of the ways that the Bible says we can be saved, only so you can turn around and add the word alone when it serves your philosophy. You cannot make up words and philosophies to add and subtract to the Bible and then say you believe in sola scriptura. Sola scriptura claims that all of your knowledge on salvation comes from the Bible alone, but obviously it doesn't. The two cannot coexist. If I was to flip a coin, the Bible alone would be on one side and faith alone would be on the other. If the Bible alone was on a journey north, the faith alone would be heading south, wandering aimlessly. If we were at a motor speedway, the Bible alone would be in full speed overdrive. And faith alone, you guessed it, it would be stuck in reverse. You cannot make up words and philosophies and add to the Bible and subtract and then say you believe in the Bible alone. You can have faith alone, and you can have the Bible alone, but you can't have both. Now, you know, in biblical times, they had a really good system on how to add and, and to the scriptures and to get to make scriptures. The Apostle Peter said, I can't follow your notes. The Apostle Peter said that um, holy men of God spoke, they were moved upon by the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how we got scripture. Now, obviously, I'm not a holy man of God. But you know what? It works a good for Matt. I think I'm going to give it a go. You just tell me what you think. So, here's a scripture. It says we're saved by hope alone. Oh, we all hope. We're all saved. Good. Here's another one. John 5. 
He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me alone is saved. That's not believing on Jesus. That's believing on his Father. So we're saved if we just believe in God. And I know you're not going to like this one, but I don't like you guys out in the morning alone either. So here goes. Matthew 21, 31. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, the publicans and harlots alone go into the kingdom of God. Wow. Can you believe that? Do you see what happens to the Bible when you add the word alone? It changes the entire meaning. Now, would any of you accept it when I added the word alone? No. But more important, would God accept it? Absolutely not. And so my question to you would be, if God won't accept it when I add the word alone, what makes you think God's going to accept it when Matt adds the word alone? And you're the ones that quote Revelations 22 to us all the time about adding and subtracting words. I just read 20 places where Jesus and his apostles specifically said how to be saved. Now Matt will attempt to explain away the very words of God with his faith alone philosophy. The faith alone philosophy, oh, now, the faith alone philosophy does not exist unless you add the word alone. By adding the word alone, it changes the entire meaning of the Bible. Thank you. This time, Matt will be giving a four minute rebuttal. That's it, just four? Four minute rebuttal, and then we'll have a, a seven minute conclusion by Matt, and a seven minute conclusion by David, and then we'll Move into our Q&A time. All right, four minutes. Respond to what he said. All right. <clears throat> David asserted that it is uh, a philosophical approach to say that a specific doctrine must be taught in specific words. <clears throat> That's a philosophical approach. He's saying philosophy, to say I have to have the word alone, it's not there. He's saying I'm doing philosophy, but yet it's a philosophical approach to say this is what's required of the scriptures in his position. That's not his self-founded scripture, that's called philosophy. So he's not aware that he's actually guilty of the very thing he accuses me of doing. So the word atheism is not found in the Bible, but in Psalm 14.1, we see that atheism, the concept is there. The doctrine of the Trinity, one God and three distinct simultaneous co-eternal persons is not found in the scriptures either. I mean, as the sentence. But the doctrine is taught through the whole of scripture. We do not have to have the philosophical assumption as being a base understanding that the word's order has to be there. In other words, we don't want to say that a descriptive summary of something the scripture says, the descriptive summary has to be in scripture for it to be true. That's a philosophical approach, and it's incorrect. Now, <clears throat> did Paul teach faith alone? Yeah, he did. Look, you have an apple and an orange, faith in works. You take works out, faith is alone. It's simple logic. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans 3.28, Romans 4.5, but to the one who does not work, but believes, and him who justifies it godly, faith is alone. I ask this of Catholics all the time. Is faith alone there? They don't want to answer. Because, it, uh, yeah, it is. It's just, this is logic. Okay, we can be logical. You mentioned 1 Peter 3.21. I love talking about baptism. I can mess you guys up when it comes to baptism. <laughs> But uh, 1 Peter 3.21, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, corresponding to what? It's the, it's the previous verse. Noah entered the ark. It was the ark that saved him, not the water. Corresponding to that, Noah, I mean, uh, baptism now saves you, not the brutal dirt from the flesh. Always quote the whole thing in the context, otherwise you get something wrong. It's Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working within you, both to will and to work, according to his good pleasure. So God's working in you. It's not that we do these things in order to get saved. Now, your salvation is the completion of God's work. Oh, and by the way, I've got so many things you've got to talk about. When <laughs> we talked about uh, Matthew 19, 17, uh, you know, what do you got to do to be saved? Jesus said, keep the commandments to be saved. Context, context. Go to Matthew 19. The lawyer said, what good thing have I got to do to be saved? He's presupposing that he can be good to get saved. And you'll notice that if Jesus answers people according to their question because they don't have eyes to see. In fact, he speaks in parables 
in Mark 4, 10 through 12, so they will not see and not be forgiven. I can show you about this because that's what God does. Because there are people who are given the eyes to see and others who are not. And they're not being able to see because this man doesn't see that it's through Christ. It's faith alone in Christ alone, not by his works of the law. Then Jesus said, just do these things. Well, I've done them all. Really? You have? Have you sold everything? Well, no. Then you haven't done it all. Because people measure themselves by their own ability, thinking they're the ones who know what the standard of the law is. Yeah, I've done it. And essentially what they're doing is they are keeping themselves right with the infinitely holy God by their efforts and by their works. And I would love to talk about, he wants all of you to say this, first of Peter 3, 9. You can also cross-reference it with uh, 1, Peter, I mean, 1 Timothy 2, 4. Go across the street, ask me, I'll tell you stuff about the word all, how it all works. And you'll go home tonight and you'll say, man, I don't like talking to him. Man, it's irritating. But it's in the Bible. I'll show you stuff. It's in Scripture. Okay, that's an invitation for tonight. I'm out of time. I got 30 seconds. No, I got 30 seconds? Yeah. Oh, well, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> slick and quick, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and at this time, uh, Matt will give a seven-minute conclusion. Conclusion. All right. Let me, let me do this. Seven minutes. And then set it up so when he's on, it's for three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, it was outward. That was to say that out loud. At the end, we're going to have an arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm older than him, so I don't know how to do it. <laughs> All right. By the way, I'm a sesogenarian. That's sesogenarian verbiage. Oh, it's kind of esoteric, but it's okay. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Seven minutes. All right. If you can see, I love theology. I've debated this hundreds of times. I like to have fun as well. All right. But it's a serious thing. Amen. You have to decide. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? What are you going to appeal to for the forgiveness of your sins? Are you going to appeal to the work of Christ? And then this whole other topic of who Christ is, that's a whole other topic. You're going to appeal to the work of Christ and yourself. That's what it comes down to. Are you going to appeal to the infinitely holy God whose presence is so vastly incredible that you throw yourself to the ground and wail because he's holy and you don't dare dare to offer up anything on your behalf for him nothing amen or are you going to say well you know i tithed i was baptized i didn't defraud my neighbor i helped many people i've helped many people i'm sure he has too I've done all these good things. I've tried to keep your commandments. I've mowed next door ladies lawn once. I shaved that lady's car tire once. You know, whatever. I'm not mocking those things. I'm just saying, whatever it might be. And you say, Lord, did we not, did I not do this and this and this? In your name. Get away from me, I never knew you. See, <clears throat> it comes down to your view of God. The Trinity is a necessary precondition for all intelligibility. Only in the Trinity can the issue of the one and the many, universals and particulars, be solved. Unitarianism doesn't work, binitarianism doesn't work, only Trinitarianism does. Only in Trinitarianism can we have the incarnation where the fullness of God himself, Colossians 2, 9, while the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form in the person of Jesus. Only the Trinitarian concept, not a triad of three gods, or one god in three manifestations, so modal monarchianism, Sabellianism, one is Pentecostal, okay, all those false things. Only in the Trinity can we have himself become one of us and live under the law that he himself gave. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God said, let there be light. God says, don't lie. This is out of his abundance of his heart, out of his character. So the law is a reflection of the character of God. And God says, Peter says, <clears throat> that God is holy. He says, 1 Peter 1, 16, be holy, for I am holy. What's the standard? You? Nope. 
God. Be holy, for I am holy. God's standard is himself. The standard is perfection. Does he ever fail? No, he does not. That's why Jesus is the only one, God in flesh, two natures, God and man, attributes of both natures, described the single person, it's called the communicatio idiomatum. It's only because of what Jesus is and what he did that he is the one who could fulfill the law and he came to fulfill it, Matthew 5, 17, and he never sinned, never broke the law, 1 Peter 2, 22. Therefore, God did everything. This is biblical theology. God did everything that we need to have done. To tell us die, it is finished, Jesus says on the cross. To tell us die is a legal term. Legal term, I can tie it into all kinds of neat stuff. And so much I can show you. And he did everything under that law. He fulfilled it perfectly. So what's left for us to do? Nothing. Because everything that you are, everything in your heart, Every good deed you, you've committed or tried to do is touched by sin. We are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2 3. The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful, no man can trust it, Jeremiah 17 9. I say to people, you know, they, they say, I don't sin anymore. There's actually groups, I don't even sin anymore. I say, spend five minutes with me, I'll, I'll fix that. <laughs> because I am a sinner, and they are too, and they'll come out. Are we going to offer our good works? Sin stained works before God? He says, be holy for I am holy. He doesn't say, offer me good works and I'll get you saved. That's a philosophy. That's a philosophy of men. It's taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Unitarians. It's taught by the Muslims. Surah 23, 1 to 103. It's taught by the Christadelphians. It's taught by the Roman Catholics. It's taught by the Eastern Orthodox, the Roman, Ortho, I mean, the Russian Orthodox. It's taught by a bunch of cults you don't even know about. Eastern, I can get into some. It's all taught. All of them teach the same thing. You have faith in God and what you do, and that you are actually good enough. What this ultimately is, and this is, I'm careful when I'm saying this because I don't mean to insult anyone. And if you're a Mormon, please understand, I, I don't hate you. But this is arrogance, it's pride, to say, look, and I say to the Catholics too, I, I mean, everybody, I should say, look, it, it's pride to say that you are gonna add to what Christ has done by obedience, and therefore, thereby, his work and your work combined is what gets you saved, and what keeps you saved. My heart aches. Amen. My heart, it aches for those who say that, because they have not ever been in the presence of of incredible holiness because they would throw that away instantly knowing that nothing they can do in any way shape or form is good enough this is why we, our faith is in Jesus God in flesh and only by him we're saved by grace through faith that's what the Bible says not of yourself not of works mm -hmm. Ephesians 2 8 and 9 it says it right there you're saved by faith and we don't keep ourselves right with the infinitely holy God by our goodness either. That's just more pride. Let's get rid of the pride. Let's turn our hearts open, bare before the cross of Christ, and ask Jesus to forgive us of all of our sins so that he might receive all of the glory. Amen. 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 I agree with a lot of what Matt said. And we, and we aren't saved by works. We're not saved by faith alone. So what exactly did Matt Slick prove tonight? Certainly not what he wanted to. And how sad to believe that you can do nothing. Just read the Bible and mark what Jesus expects of you, not what Matt tells you. So are we saved by faith alone or works? We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ in that we will all be resurrected. There's no other name by which man can be saved. And there are no works that anyone is capable of doing to save themselves. Our works save us from eternal suffering, not because of our own selves, lest any man shall boast. We are not saved by our works. We are judged and rewarded by them. 
It is through our faith and obedience to God's commandments that we are judged and rewarded. And that will determine our eternal reward. Jesus set that up. And this is only possible because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus who set forth these rules for us to follow. He predetermined the rewards if we choose to submit to his will. Now before I go on, I want you to know that what I've said tonight is good news. If you're an evangelical Christian, quit believing you're saved by faith alone. I know you love our Savior. This will only bring you closer to him. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. If you're a preacher, stop preaching that please. Don't turn the Ten Commandments into the Ten Suggestions. Jesus said, In vain they have worshipped me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, making the commandments of God of none effect. What modern day tradition, tradition teaches the commandments of God are of none effect, and that's the faith alone philosophy. And while we're talking good news, got to throw this in, let me share some more. I invite you to learn of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ with living apostles and prophets, priesthood authority, angelic visitors, modern day revelations, and the Book of Mormon, as the Bible says, by two witness, witnesses shall his word be established. We have the testimony of two nations. And you owe it to yourself to earn, learn from the source, not some disgruntled ex-Mormon or someone who profits financially. Um, should we believe the man-made faith alone philosophy that Matt so eloquently describes? Um, or the very words of Jesus, which are written in the Bible. Two very different things. Your philosophy is wrong not because I say it's wrong. It's wrong because its teachings are not written in the Bible. If Matt didn't get straight A's in theology school, he should have. I do agree with a lot of what he says, but his goal is to convince you that God said something in the Bible that God never said. And you are supposed to believe it even though... Your faith says you only believe what's written in the Bible. The only way to actually read that you're saved by faith alone is to take the Bible, close the Bible, set it aside, and read it in some other periodical. The only two times these words are even used together in the same verse specifically says you're not saved by faith alone and you're not justified by faith alone. Um, it, only, oh, it only takes one scripture that says you're saved by a way other than faith alone to disprove the faith alone philosophy. And it takes at least one scripture that says you're saved by faith alone to make that philosophy even plausible. Apparently no one can produce that one scripture that says we're saved by faith alone because God went out of his way not to say it. And although I only needed one, I produced 20. Scriptures that show salvation other than by faith alone. Now, Matt shared his opinion with us 11 times. 11 times he says we're faith, saved by faith alone. Nothing more than his opinion. Let that sink in. But for some reason, he feels good about all this. I don't know. These numbers, they don't add up. And if I was a betting man, I'd throw a couple bucks on his philosophy, but there is no way I would bet my eternal salvation on his opinion. Heaven forbid that anyone should leave here tonight thinking we are saved by faith alone because of someone's opinion. Everyone saw how ridiculous it was when I added the word alone, but some of you are thinking, well, maybe if we add it or Matt adds it, it'll, it'll work, God will accept it, but he will not. For those of you still grasping onto this philosophy, I have one last set of numbers, and I have time to use a drink. <laughs> okay, one last set of numbers. In the three years of his mortal ministry, Jesus never said we're saved by faith alone. In the 34 years of his life, Jesus never said we're saved by faith alone. In the 4,000 years of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, God never said we're saved by faith alone. In the 7,000 years of the creation written in the Bible, the 1,000 years of the millennium, and eternity on, God never said we're saved by faith alone. So I guess my question to you would be, 
is God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, the Apostles and Prophets, and the Holy Bible never says we're saved by faith alone, then why do you? And more important, when will you stop? And these things I say in the name of the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time I have some questions that have been posed by our audience tonight. And so I will start with just the first question. Hey, wait, yeah, Russ. Oh, we have a bathroom break? Uh, we sure can. We sure can. So we'll come back in. We'll come back in time in just five minutes. We'll back in five minutes, we'll have some Q&A time. And then, while we're taking that break, if you'd like to make, make us a question, set a question up to me uh, by way of text message. My number is 801-645-7433. That's 801-645-7433. If we don't get to all of your questions, I will do my very best to get you an answer. It might be you know, tomorrow or the next day, but I will do that. And also, 3701 Harrison Boulevard, uh, right about 7 o'clock, well, 6.30 or so, we'll be over there for um, some pizza and some more time to try to discuss some of these things. So that's right across the street on Harrison next to Jimmy John's. So you have to go. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. You are welcome to join us over there at our ministry house. We have a Bible museum over there as well. So we have some really great things to show you there. So we'll be right back. Just about four minutes from now. Russ, will you tell me the address where we're sure. going again? Where we're going okay. again? Thirty-seven zero one Harrison. Yep. Thirty-seven zero one. Thirty-seven zero one Harrison Boulevard. And what's the name of the place? You'll see AMA twenty out on the on the sign. AMA twenty. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Can you get by me or should I stand up? Sure. Which would be better? <laughs> I would have stood up if you wanted me no, to. No, you're fine. Should, I always tell everybody, just hold still while I step over you. Let's <laughs> see ya.
Good. That would have been a good idea. Yeah. But. We'll go ahead and start our Q&A. We may have to end our time together here rather abruptly because of just certain um, you know, time constraints here at the Wildcat Theater for, to, for this evening. But if that happens, hey, you can go across the street, 3701 Harrison, love to have you see our small Bible museum and uh, have some refreshments and continue this discussion. So let's just start and see if our men are up there, yes? Okay. And we've got important Dave, here. come on up. <laughs> Our first question, I'm going to just go ahead and the order. They were, how they were made. Give me one second here. The first question is for David. And maybe we should just keep these responses one fairly one. quick. Yeah, one and one. We'll just kind of, some, some of them are, are addressed. We're just going to do a one minute each. Okay, one minute each. Here's the first question. Okay. Let's, let's start with this first question, is um, what works did Abraham do? Okay, real quick. Abraham did no works that saved him. This, this thing of going from James back to Abraham when he says, nobody was saved by the blood or the, the blood of bulls or lambs or sheep or anything. That's not salvation. Everything somebody did outside of, this, of the sacrament of Christ is just, um, it's nothing. It's, it's counted as, as um, faith, but it's not, no works saved anybody, even here. I mean, a guy just mentioned Matthew where it says that you clothed them and gave them a drink and they're saved. It has nothing to do with our faith alone. I am so glad that we live the law of faith. I love Christ. I love that his, his word is faith, but it's not faith alone. You can't. You can't let Jesus say, I want you to do this, this, and this, and you say, oh, I have faith alone. Go to the gym, accept a personal trainer, and he'll show you how to get in shape, and a year later, you have faith. Go back, and how did it work? Faith without works is dead. All right, thank Abraham, you. Abraham didn't. Um, Amen. All right, thank you. Nothing faith Abraham did is dead. I'm going to do my best to be fair on, on these questions and answer time, so here we go. Um, Matt, this question says this. Lately I've determined that the admission of the LDS church, oh, that their faith, yes. Oh. I'm supposed to respond to what you said. Oh, you want to respond to the question? question? Yeah. yeah. One minute. What was the question though, the first one? Oh, the first question. Okay, we'll have, you want, okay. What did Abraham do? Right. What, did Abraham what, what were the works of Abraham? What, what, what works did Abraham do? Well, he did lots of works. He moved, he, you know, circumcised the kids, lots of works. But those aren't what saved it because Genesis 15 says, Abraham believed God, it was credited him as righteousness. Notice the legality of crediting. That's what's going on, that's all it was. So he, before the law was codified, he was justified by faith. And after the law was codified, he justified by faith. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. I agree with that codification stuff too, just so you know. I just don't know that terminology. All right, Dave, you're this next question. Me again? Do you want to have both, both people answer each question? Yeah, we're going to have both people okay, answer. Okay, one, one, the next one is for you then. Okay. Um, the question is this. Lately I've determined that the admission of the LDS Church that their faith is not in the biblical Jesus is in fact in their name. Their Jesus is the church, oh, excuse me, is the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Who's that? I'm reading it as I, let me read it again. Lately I've determined that the admission of the LDS Church that their faith is not in the biblical Jesus, 
is in fact in their name. Their Jesus is the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Who's that? Yeah, Latter Days is the last days. We've had saints throughout the time. Um, they were saints when Christ lived, but these are the latter days. Um, our Christ is the same Christ of the Bible. He was born from the Virgin Mary. He grew up. He died for the sins of the world. He was resurrected, and he went to his God. Um, one of these things, I got a minute. Um, you say, oh, yeah, your God has a God. Well, it's interesting because your God came to earth, got a body, was resurrected, and now he's God as a man, as a man God. That's what we believe. It's like, it's okay if that's with, with your God, but our God, that couldn't happen to you. Did that make sense? No, it's not. Well, it's to me. <laughs> All right, Matt, same question. Would you like to, would you like to have this question? Yes. Lately, I have determined that the mission of the LDS Church, that their faith is not in the book of Jesus. In fact, in their name, their Jesus is the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Who's that? Okay, who said that? The first word. The first word of the question? Yeah. Lately? Lately? Lately. 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 Like, oh, more recently. <laughs> oh, lately. 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 Oh, sorry, that's what I said. No, the, sorry, we're not talking about... This isn't supposed to be the debate topic, but it, you know, I answer it. The Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the Bible. It is the God of Mormonism, not the God of the Bible. I can prove it, I can show it, I can teach on it. It is absolutely different. It's just simple logic. You cannot have it be the case that a circle is round and also not the case that it's round. You cannot have a case that God's a trinity and also not a trinity, Mormonism. You cannot have the case that Jesus is not the brother of the devil and also the brother of the devil. You cannot have these things. It's logically impossible. It's a law of non-contradiction and go in and show you all kinds of differences. Amen. This is why faith is only as good as who you put it in. You put it in the God of Mormonism, you're going to go to hell. And not, I'm not trying to be offensive. It is not the God of the Bible. It is not the true God. You have to understand this. It's not true. It's a false god, and ultimately it's demonic. I'm not trying to be offensive, but if you want to talk to me, please, I will beg you. I will come, I will drive back down here from Idaho. I will spend time with you and talk about who the true God is from Scripture. That's what I want to do. Amen. All right, thank you. Next question, David. Here's the next question for you. You guys picking on me? <laughs> We're going back and forth. Okay, but you, I mean, unless you'd like to. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. All right. Hey, this question. This is a question. Well, this is a question for David. It says, oh, but we'll get I can answer it for you. <laughs> I'll get you an answer. It says, Do you agree with Joseph Smith's translation of Romans 3.28, which reads, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28. Joseph Smith translation. If not, why not? Want me to answer for you? <laughs> You're both going to answer. Well, I, I can't respond to what you're saying. Well, I want to respond. The to JST is, is false. The JST is invented by Joseph. It's not even one of the four standard works. So why is anybody going to use it? Why? Because Joseph Smith, sorry, he didn't know what he was doing. Oh, man. And so he's the one who added all this works to uh, this stuff to uh, the scriptures. I, I can't even say, I don't want to offend the Mormons. I can't say what I really think. It's just not good. Okay? So he's not true. He's not a true prophet. The Bible says the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, Luke 16, 16. And it also said in 1 Timothy 4, uh, 1 Timothy, oh Christ, 1 Timothy 6, 16, that the Father dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. Joseph Smith said he saw the Father. It's impossible. You pick scripture, you trust Joseph Smith, not both, either one. He's not true. JST is false. So we read, we read the question? Or? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, repeat. Okay. This is a question for David. Do you agree with Joseph Smith's translation of Romans 3.28, which reads, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone without the deeds of the law. Romans 3.28, Joseph Smith translation. If not, why not? Okay. Um, I agree that we're not justified by the works of the law. We're not saved by the works of the law either. Um, I, I don't know. It says faith alone. I haven't read that one before. Joseph Smith saying that. Um, Joseph Smith is a true prophet. You know, there's so many things. You, you can attack Joseph Smith, but you can take the same things and it happens all throughout the Bible. Um, other prophets have done it. Other, you know, the Apostle Paul, he says, he says he endured all things for us. I thought that was Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, 
They love me so much that they rip their eyeballs out and give them to me. He calls them their son. The things that Paul said, you guys would attack Joseph Smith. Instead, he gets a pass. Um, yeah, I, I'm not concerned with the things that people say about Joseph Smith. Um, as far as this false god, it is so obvious. If you read all the scriptures that talk about the, the Savior, his Father, the Son, um, Jesus, when he talks to Mary, he says, I go to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. He says, I do nothing of myself but what I've seen my Father do. Um, he can get up here and say, oh, I can tell you this and I can teach you that. Well, you know what? I can take the Bible and go through it with you. And there's a difference. He's a lot slicker and smoother, no doubt. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to... It's a good name. It is. <laughs> okay, I'm going to another question. This is a specific question to David, but we can... Um, all right. Okay, question to David. You said in your opening statement that the term faith alone isn't in the Bible. Therefore, faith alone isn't a biblical doctrine. The word missionary isn't in the King James Bible. Are you then saying there that there are no missionaries in the Bible? Isn't this argument just a red herring? Oh, no. This argument is exactly correct. It doesn't matter that it's not in there, okay? I understand there's things that happen that isn't written in there. But when it specifically says all these times and then it says different, that means it's not a true doctrine. Um, faith alone is a philosophy because how many times does Jesus say, I named off 20 ways that Jesus said you could be saved. He said, oh, obey, that's, that's heresy or whatever. I don't know what he said. Rewind it. But um, he did say you're not saved by obeying, but the scripture says you are saved by obeying. So, it's a philosophy, and, and it's a good one, and it's a feel-good one, and oh, we just got to believe, and I feel the same way. I just want to love Christ. I want to love Him. I want to depend on Him, but then I guess I'm bad because, well, God, now He told me to do something, and if I do it, some people are going to say, you're working your way to heaven, and I'm like, no, I'm just doing what my Savior asked, and there's a difference. Okay, thank you. This question is for both of you. So we can start with Matt, since David just wrote it. Okay, Matt, the question is, can we truly understand the difference between the LDS view and evangelical view of faith versus faith slash works without addressing the following? The difference in the nature of God, difference in the nature of man, the difference in the nature of salvation, the difference on the pre-existence. The answer is no. <laughs> All right, David. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, thank you. No. We'll go on to the next question. Uh, Great question. Great next question. question is. Oh boy, it's like a three point three part question. Um, let's see. Question: If our faith is subject, or in addition to works or sincerity sounds conditional, then I have two questions about that. One, when have you done enough good or sincerity or repentance to win God's approval? What is the criteria or level? How much? Sounds uncertain to me, or worse, dependent on me. Two, wouldn't that be like living under a question mark much of the time? Does God really want to rely on us at all? Isn't that the point of the Romans road? We're fallen and, and fallible? I don't ever see the Bible enumerating any level of works, repentance, or sincerity. Okay, too Thanks. much. Let's go back to number one. Okay, number one. Matt, you want to answer number I, I one? Can't, I can't remember the first one. Okay, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. <laughs> number one. Question, but too much for us. That's right, that's right. Number one. When have you done enough good or sincerity or repentance to win God's approval? What is the criteria or level? How much? When have I done enough good? Never. Okay, Dan. <laughs> when have you done enough good? Good answer, Matt. I agree. Um, I've never done enough. I never will do enough to merit salvation. But I'll do enough that Christ will know that I love him. He's my savior. And I rely on him wholly. Um, I could reverse that question and say, when do you know if you have enough faith? I mean, if you have faith a grain of the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Any takers? Christ says, be ye therefore perfect as I'm perfect. He says, if you... If you believe on me, do the works I've done. Have any of you guys done that? Christ always talks if you have a little faith. 
You have enough faith that you can commit any sin once you're saved, and you're saved no matter what, and the Bible never says that. But you have enough faith. I don't agree. Uh, it does not say that by faith alone, or there's a certain amount of faith you need, but as far as works goes, Christ told us what to do. We either do it or we don't do it. We, we receive the blessings in this life for doing it. We receive the blessings in the next life. It's 100% up to Jesus. My life is 100% Jesus. Period. Okay, here's another question. This, this says, in case you have time, another question for David. Uh, Romans 11.35 says, God will be a debtor to no man, quoting from Job. Don't works or any act we do, in addition to faith, require some recompense slash or debt from God to us. Thanks. That would be quick. Um, read it again. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I lost it coming That's right. No, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Romans 11.35 says, God will be a debtor to no man, quoting from Job. Don't works or any act we do, in addition to faith, require some recompense or debt from God to us. Okay, God, God has, and he's in debt to nothing to us. We are nothing, nothing we can do will amount to anything. But he offered a gift, and, we're, and we can receive that gift. Um, darn, there was more to it. Read it again. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. Romans 11.35 says, God will be a debtor to no man, quoting from Job. Don't works or any act we do in addition to faith require some recompense or debt from God to us? Um, yeah. Faith is a work. Paul said it's a work. Just read about faith. Faith is a work. It takes effort. You guys are here. I mean, there's so many other places you could go or be but it takes effort to believe in God. Um, I know he's going to say, well, God called you, and he's going to have a lot of scriptures too, but there's just as many scriptures. I've got a list of scriptures. I just can't remember. But, yeah. Next question for Dave. Would you say your ability to do good works comes from God? Okay. I'd like to thank Matt for coming tonight. <laughs> Take your seat. You want me to answer you? Okay, I've got a question for you. Just one second. What? Okay. So, Dave, uh, would you say your ability to do good works comes from God? Oh, absolutely. Okay. You know, okay, I, I think I mentioned I do good works because it makes me feel good. I do good works because Jesus asked me. And sometimes I do good works because I don't want to go to hell. I've never done good works because of the law of Moses. Um, if Jesus wants to put a carrot in front of me and say, if you do this, you get a reward, great. That's up to Jesus, but I don't, yeah, my works are not. Okay, this question is for Matt, unless you want to comment on that one, Matt. <clears throat> yeah. No one's done any good works unless it's in the, true, the name of the true God and true Christ. Otherwise, it's vain philosophy. It's not a good work. You can do good works on the human level, but not on the divine. Goodness is not measured by our sincerity and effort, but by God's. And so you have to have faith in the true God, true Christ, in order for work to be good. And there's other criteria we can get into that. Across the street between pizza slices. Okay, yeah, the pizza is going to be there pretty quick. Question for Matt. Did the doctrine of sola fide exist prior to the Reformation, and was it known by the majority of the church laymen? Yes, uh, the Bible says in First John, I mean, First Corinthians four six, you're not to exceed what's written. Jesus, when he was, he's God in flesh, was dealing with Satan. He quoted Scripture. And in Acts 17, 11, Paul and Silas were preaching and teaching, and the Bereans checked what he said against Scripture, and he called them noble-minded. So yes, the doctrine of the of, of Stola Scriptura, Scriptura is there, and in it, Sola Fide is there because it's taught in Genesis 15, 6, it's taught in Galatians 3, 28, uh, Galatians 3, 20, Romans uh, 4, 1 through 5, uh, Galatians uh, 2, 16, 2, 21, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, I can go into all these. Yeah, it's there in Scripture. So it, it, when did it come about? I'll tell you when it came about. Forever ago in the mind of the Trinity. That's where it came about. Mm. It's all over this. All right, thank you. And by the way, this whole event tonight, this afternoon, it has been videotaped, and so if you'd like to get a, a link or a copy, just talk to either David Robinson or talk to Matt Slick or myself, and we'll help you get that. This next question is for David. I wanted to respond. Oh, you want to comment to that? Okay. You know, this Sola Scriptura that 
Everything comes from the Bible. We don't believe the Bible's in there infallible or complete. Um, the things that it says in the Bible that says that it doesn't say what Matt's saying. I mean, I wish I knew all these scriptures, but there's plenty that say that it isn't. Um, God said... Like where? Where? Where does okay. it say anything? Let's get, let's get more questions on, 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 here, on, on this, if we could, please. Thanks. Okay. And save it for the cross the street. Thanks. Come to the blue house and I'll tell you. Yeah. Okay, uh, this question is for David. Where in the Bible does Jesus say that the gospel needed to be restored? Please also explain what you mean by gospel. Gospel is the good news of Christ. It's his love. It's, it's what we need to make a part of our lives to love him and to return with him. Where does it say it needs to be restored? Well, it's a couple places. It says that um, um, there are a couple places. It says that there will be a falling away and a restoration of all things before the coming of Christ. We know there was a falling away. He says that we would always have apostles and prophets till the coming of Christ. Um, where's our apostles and prophets? They died off. Um, they continued to call more, but they died off. So we needed a restoration. And, and okay. okay, now I'm looking stupid. Um, next question. Can I respond to that? Oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> The apostles and prophets are spoken of in Hebrew, excuse me, in Ephesians 4, uh, roughly 10 through 12, and they are what laid the foundation, they're not to be repeated. I'd get into the doctrine of apostles and prophets. The apostasy is out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and concomitant with it is the arrival of the Antichrist. So it hasn't happened yet, so there was no apostasy because it says the apostasy must come first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. So they're concomitant, they're always tied together. That's not happened yet. And I'll just tell you, having studied many religions, many of them say there was an apostasy and we are the restored truth. It happens across the board. Okay, I've got Amen. three questions from the same person. They're both addressed to John. Maybe there's a little confusion as to who this was, so I'm gonna give this to both you guys. Um, what saved the thief on the cross? What saved the thief on the cross? Where, where, where Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, Jesus saved him, and um, it was his faith in Christ. And that's all. No works, nothing. Just faith right there. Right. Amen. I'm not going to say amen. Um, well, what he saved on the cross, he said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Um, he did no works. God knew his heart. I don't know what he was like. He felt repentant. He recognized Christ. Um, but three days later, Christ appeared to Mary and said, Touch me not, I've not yet ascended to my Father. And he went and taught the gospel to the spirits in prison. Um, paradise in heaven, we believe, is different. So the, the thief wasn't saved because of nothing. I don't know what his heart was like. Christ knew it. I don't. Okay, you can stay up here if you want for this next one. Um, this says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, Romans 4, 5. What is credited as righteousness? Probably the works that he did. I mean, his life he lived up, he lived up to that point. He credited that as righteousness. He credited his heart. The guy did the works out of the goodness of his heart. That's why the law of Moses left. If you, if you took too many steps on Sunday, you'd be stoned. Now, we're supposed to keep the Sabbath just because we love Jesus. The other stuff is credited as, as righteousness. Um, everything we do in this life, Christ will credit it for righteousness or not. If we do works because I want to be seen of man, it's in the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't pray in open. Pray in secret, and I'll reward you openly. Thank you, Matt. Actually, it's that's a very question I ask Catholics all the time, many sort of times. What was credited as righteousness? And I wait for them to answer. And then they give me a lot of answers sometimes. I say, let's read it again, let's read it again. What does it say? The answer is faith. It's the very faith that God granted. Philippians, uh, Romans 4 3. And Abraham believed God who was credited as righteousness. And Romans 4 5. The one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. It's by faith, the faith that God gives, therefore he gets all the glory. Okay, thank you. Stay up here for this next one. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 4.13. Besides the righteousness of faith, what works did Abraham do? 
Uh, there's a se separation there because that's a very interesting topic to, to talk about because what is, it's kind of a cross-reference of uh, Romans 4, 13, uh, yeah, Romans 4, well, Romans 4, no, I'll get into that. This is for, Romans 4, 13. Yeah. yeah, there's some stuff in there, but then we'll get into it. So, uh, in Genesis 12, 3, God says, in you all the nations shall be blessed. That's quoted by Paul in Galatians 3, 8, he calls it the gospel. That's what that is meant uh, in that issue of of uh, the blessing and everything that comes forward. I'm trying to remember the question exactly uh, because it's, there's a lot of theology in that particular area, a lot. So, what was the question again? Oh yeah, uh, besides the righteousness of faith, what works did Abraham do? Yeah, he did lots of works by mercy, but he did it because he's a follower of God. Those things aren't what got him saved or kept him saved. David, you want to say a question? I agree with everything he said. <laughs> But we are not saved by faith alone. It's very simple. It doesn't matter how many times we say we have to believe or how many times you can say you have to have faith. If you believe, you're going to do the works of Jesus and greater works you'll do. If you believe, you're saved and your whole house is saved. There's so many times. Is that me and my family? Is that me and my mom and sisters and brothers? Just because it says that we're saved by a certain way, it means we need to do more too. It's like the example of the um, gym. You either go and do the works or you don't. But by faith, you're going to get there. But it never says faith alone. you got to get past adding the word. I still agree with Matt. It's a heresy to add the word alone. That's terrible. You're right. Okay, the next question is for Matt. Here's the question. How is the Trinity a real concept? If the Bible states in multiple scriptures that Jesus is the Son of God while Jesus was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. Matt, you believe that Jesus is God when the Bible clearly says that Jesus is the Son of God. Is everything in the Bible totally the opposite of what it states? That right there is a half hour to an hour discussion. Uh, the term Son of God, they ask you, what does the term Son of God mean? They mean he's not God. What does the term Son of Man mean? It's not man. The term Son of God meant he was God in flesh. You can verify it by going to John 5, 18, calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. The doctrine of the Trinity has arrived at systematically through the whole of Scripture. I can define it. In fact, I can teach on it a lot. It's a wonderful doctrine. But um, <clears throat> there's just way too much to have to answer in that question. Yeah. There's a lot of theology Amen. and foundational information that needs to be laid out. So we were over at the Blue House. If yeah. you'd like to come over yeah. for that. It's a great question, though. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to say it again. Oh, yeah, sure. Give me one second. <clears throat> How is the Trinity a real concept if the Bible states in multiple scriptures that Jesus is the Son of God? While Jesus was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they have done. Matt, do you believe that Jesus is God when the Bible clearly says that Jesus is the Son of God? Is everything in the Bible totally the opposite of what it states? Uh, faith alone, yeah. But um, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. He refers to him as his Father. He says, he says, I do nothing but what I see my Father do. He didn't want to be crucified, but he went into the garden and he prayed, and he says, Father, not my will, but your will. It's constant. But one thing that I want to say is, why did Jesus say to forgive the people that crucified him? Did they believe in him? Did Jesus forgive them just so he could send them to hell? Or why is that? They didn't have faith alone. So Jesus is going to go around and forgiving people just so he can send them to hell later. Yeah, Faith alone is not a true philosophy. It doesn't matter how many times you say it or how eloquent or how many words you throw in. Read the Bible. Too many scriptures absolutely contradict the faith alone philosophy. These two are for you, Dave. These two just got right here. <clears throat> okay, it says, which works, this is questions, questions for David, two of them. which works save you then, sorry, which works save you then, which scripture says save by faith after all you can do? Um, no works save you, period. Have we not understood this yet? We don't live the law of Moses, we don't believe that you have to do works to be saved. Christ saved everybody. We're judged and rewarded according to. If Christ says, I'm going to give you a reward, and you do it, you're going to get saved for it. The one that says, saved by faith after all we can do? Yeah, which works save you then? 
which scripture says saved by faith after all you can do? And, and I think that's in um, the Book of Mormon. But there's at least a dozen scriptures where it says you're saved if you do this. You'll receive your reward after you do that. It's all through the Bible. But instead of reading what Paul and John and James says, you're going to sneak over here and say, well, there's this one little thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's taught in the Bible. It doesn't say you're saved by faith alone and you can never fall away. I read a bunch of them. But you go look up if, then, and accept, and you'll be surprised what the Bible teaches. Next question, David, for you. It's David only said not faith alone. Why didn't he say anything about salvation by works? Which works? I just kind of answered that. Okay, okay. We are not saved by works. Okay. Period. Okay. We're judged and rewarded. Okay. Period. In fact, you can find that it'll say in the Bible that you were judged and rewarded by your works and your deeds, and it'll never say you're judged and rewarded by your faith. It's just accounted to your... Uh -oh. Okay, this, this question is for Matt. Can you please clarify the meaning of biblical repentance and contrast it with LDS repentance? LDS repentance is not super clarified. They don't have a systematic theology, so it's difficult to understand what they teach in a lot of things. The different prophets and apostles have taught different things over the years, so it's difficult. But they need, what they need to produce is a systematic theology that's official and says what exactly what they mean by this. But biblically speaking, repentance is the Greek word metanoia, which means change of mind and attitude. God grants it to us, 2 Timothy 2.25. It means to turn away from those things that you're not supposed to be doing. Basically, that's what Mormonism says as well. And that's fine. However, I think it's in D&C oh, 82.7, that if you say you have to repent, and then you commit the same sins, then the former ones come back upon you. So that's what their definition of repentance is, is to never do it again. But that's not how it works biblically, even though that's the intention. They're back under the law. I mean, it gets more new minutiae here. It gets more complicated to talk about. But there's a, a difference because of the difference in theology and, and stuff. But anyway, there's, there's a lot. Okay, thank you. And our last question for the... Wait, wait. Oh, oh, go ahead. There is a scripture, and um, I wish I had Matt's brain, but yeah, in, in the scriptures it says that if you sin and then you go back and sin again, well, where's the forgiveness of it? You, you, um, you crucify Christ anew. And that's in the Bible. I don't know which verse, but we'll, we can look. Last question for the Hebrews, for David. Hebrews 10, 26. You go and sit in will clear your Yeah. All right, David, last question is for you. It says, ask David, what is the definition of truth to a Mormon? Good question. The definition of truth would be whatever God establishes as true. If, if God said, this is the way you live, these are the things you need to do, then that's the way you need to live, and that's the way you need to do. Um, I may not say that as eloquent as Matt might come up and say, but truth is eternal. Truth isn't going to change, and um, we all need to find the truth. I believe I found the truth through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I respect your opinions, um, but I still don't see, and I'm not worried about offending anybody, because obviously we don't agree, but... Um, I don't believe that what you're teaching is biblical, any of it. And, and it doesn't matter how many ways and scriptures you can form together and say, well, this, 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 this. But in reality, not only does it not say it, but it does say exactly the opposite. Thank you. And with that, let's show our appreciation to both men. Okay, go ahead. Please. Truth is what corresponds to the mind of God. Truth is the person of Jesus Christ. It was a good philosophical answer he gave. All right, let's, let's close in prayer, shall we? And I hope to see, see as many of you as, as possible over at the Flute House 3701 Harrison. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this time together tonight. We want you to be glorified. We, we ask for your spirit to continue to move and give us the freedom to um, ask questions and to dig into your word for our truth. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.